I started seeing him as a uh, the flickering flame of Indianism. It was flickering because everything that we had was down to one man. I can say this mostly about my father, Turkey Tayak. He fought to hold on to his identity as an Indian when it was not popular to be an Indian and even dangerous to be an Indian. But from him holding on, it caused a, it brought about a new hope, a new beginning for the Piscataway people. Chief Turkey was, he was a medicine person, he was an herbalist, he was a practitioner of many different kinds of remedies that were passed to him by his mother and his grandmother. Up here on the cliffs, uh, my grandmother used to have a house. They used to, her house used to set maybe around about 200 yards away from the cliffs. Chief Turkey was born here uh, on August the 29th, 1895, on a day that was known as uh, Frog's Day. The reason why it was called Frog's Day, uh, he was born out in the woods. And after he was born, it rained real, real heavy. And after that rain, it was just a shower, about for 10, 15 minutes, and it stopped. And what's happened is there's thousands of little frogs that come around, they jump all around, uh, you know, for 15, 25 minutes, and then all of a sudden, these frogs disappear. You never see them again. There's a lot of history here uh, prior to European contact, and a lot of history here after European contact. But it's, uh, it, it's, it's a tremendous, holy place. And Indians here from Virginia and the Indians from up north, the Indians, the Iroquois Confederacy came down here. And they used to have meetings here along the edge of the cliff, down here in this area here. Uh, they had tremendous amount of, of feasts down here, a lot of conferences down here. And that uh, it's a place where Indians have always uh, come to. Splitting away from the Leni Lenape or Delaware more than 1,000 years ago, the Tayak Adapangasinam led the Piscataway people to a new homeland on the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay in what is today known as Maryland. The Piscataway joined people who had already been living there for thousands of years and became the central nation of an indigenous alliance based at the capital town Wyone. In 1521, they met a new people who would have a devastating impact on their cherished homeland. First, the Spanish sought to enslave the people of the Chesapeake Bay area. Then later, King Charles of England deeded the entire Piscataway territory away to Lord Baltimore without the Piscataway's knowledge or consent. Our people, decimated by more than 100 years of land invasion, disease, and genocidal military attacks, decided to accept an invitation from the Iroquois Confederacy, who knew us as the Kanoi and left Maryland for Pennsylvania in 1697. The Piscataway joined the Pan-Indian movement fighting European control of eastern North America. Some of our people became the Wolf Clan of the Cayuga and moved to the Six Nations Reserve in Ontario. Others went to the Ohio Territory to continue the struggle for Indian independence against the newly formed United States. Here at the Huckleberry, it's a very special place for our family. When our people returned back from the Ohio Valley, they were allies along with the Kumsa from the Shawnee people. Our people had traveled north and were part of the confederacy of native people that were trying to stop the European civilization heading west of the Mississippi. In the early 1800s, our family returned back to the state of Maryland here, a place that they could have to find their home once again. And they found refuge in these lands here, in these woods here, living along the shores of the Potomac River. There's still Indians that come here, uh, that consider this land here holy, that's sacred, that has their ceremonies here, 
to come here to pray and to meditate. So it's a, it's a continuing thing. It's not um, something that has become extinct. God gave us this land right here. God put us right here. And these, are, these, these sacred sites are where Indian people have came for millenniums. He was born with a very strong pride in him, a very strong pride that he was a Piscataway Indian. He held on to the tradition. He held on to the culture. He held on to the medicine. He held on to the songs and dances. For the Piscataway people had already suffered over 300 years of oppression. He spent most of his life in this area, even though later on he had a home near Washington, D.C. also. But a lot of the Pis uh, Piscataways had moved up near the Washington areas during World War I because of jobs. I remember my father used to hunt a lot, he used to tell me stories about World War I when he fought in the trenches in France, when him and his brothers sold their horses after they had ridden into town in the Washington, joined the army, went off to fight the Huns. And at that time, he was machine gunned, he was gassed, he was a young man and he was given six months to live. And he returned back home here to the Huckleberry where at that time in his life, he started learning about the medicine, part of our culture, part of our tradition. He had a lot of knowledge that had existed within the Piscataway tribe for centuries. And he possessed a good amount of it that he had learned from his mother and his grandmother. And I admire Turkey for it because he was a man who really had a whole lot of knowledge of life and what it was all about, and especially the concern for his own people. He wasn't just a person who stood up for the rights of Indian people. He was a person that stood up for uh, the rights of other poor people, um, people in the labor movement. The people from the Bonus Army were in Washington. These were men, these were veterans of World War I who had, who were supposed to have received a bonus after they had um, returned home from the war and they never got it. Well, they came and they marched on Washington demanding this because this was during the Depression. So these are people who really had nothing, but they, they marched in troop formation with their battalions and um, the government, the army, made um, the choice to forcibly remove these people. I mean, what a shame. You know, these were the people who fought their war for them, took the brunt of it. Many of them had been wounded. Um, their lives had taken uh, terrible um, consequences for their involvement, and they had made that personal sacrifice. And the very system that they had been duped into thinking was going to stand up for them came and attacked them as well. So. A lot of these guys were being arrested, like they were just sweeping through Washington and, and arresting these people. And um, Turkey hit out a lot of these people in his house because he also marched in the Bonus Army. Chief Turkey and my father met uh, first uh, years and years ago, back in the 30s. And, um, and that friendship grew uh, on through uh, my father's marriage to my mother and um, where he remained friends of the family. Uh, after my parents passed on, he would come visit me on weekends and uh, to see that everything was okay with me. It was back in the early 40s in which I first met Turkey. Uh, a Mr. D.O. Crawford from Washington uh, had a, a group of uh, boys from the inner city in which he called the Indian Scouts in which he brought down and he brought Turkey down with him, and that was the first time that I had ever met Turkey. He came down a number of times, and we got to be uh, quite good friends. Um, they spent many a night here camping out, having campfires. When I first uh, met Turkey, he told me that when he was a young man, that he uh, did a lot of uh, 
camping and all around the area. And this was one of his favorite areas. At that time, it was uh, almost totally unsettled. There was only one or two houses here, and no one cared if you camped. So he spent a lot of time here on the Nanjimoy Creek. Turkey told me that when he would camp up here, he never had any problem of uh, getting all the food he, he needed from wild game or, or fish that he could catch here. So it was uh, truly a, almost a paradise for the native people when they lived here. I've heard him being described as somebody who was a man of even before the time that he came into the world. Uh, he was born in 1895, but he was very much a person of, of the past century, and this is something that my father always spoke about him, as his father being a man of the 19th century. So in many ways, he, he was a resource for many people who were looking for that kind of knowledge and understanding of the world, which has been lost uh, from so many of us. He was one with the earth. He was one with the land with the trees, the environment. He was one with animals. He had a very, very special power about him, something that we don't find too often today. The plants and the roots and the herbs, the different types of trees that we have, there's medicine power that's there that we use to cure ourselves. He could just walk up and down these cliffs and says, you know what, Billy? He says, uh, what you see here is God's pharmacy. He says, Every, there's everything here that can cure people. He said, if it isn't growing, God put it here in, in, in the earth. And these were the, the, he, what he was referring to as the medicinal clays that are here in these cliffs. What I remember most about my grandfather, Turkey, is when we would go to Huckleberry. We would go down there to get his herbs and his different roots and medicines to make his snake oil and his, I don't even know the name. The, actually, the other one was called No Name. It had no name, but it was like a brown oil. And uh, the snake oil we used mostly for headaches and um, sore throats, earaches, just about everything. And uh, what I remember most about the snake oil is when he would use it on me for my headaches. And he would massage it into the temples of my head and into the right back in here on my neck, and, uh, and it worked. He always got rid of my headaches for me. He had very strong hands, even up until, you know, he died. He probably had the strongest hands of anyone I ever knew. I wish it had been written uh, down um, that, because we do have some of the knowledge, but we don't have the, the extent that, that Turkey had. Um, he was just an encyclopedia of knowledge. Um, every plant and um, herb and certain uh, ways of mixing them and certain things that could be done to them, those were things that, that he knew. We also went to the burial grounds a lot with him and uh, look for arrowheads down there or just go down and just walk around. Um, he never really had a whole lot to say, but he was very smart, very knowledgeable. And on the burial ground, one day, one of the girls was down there, and something bit her on her lip, and her lips swole up real big. And my daughter taken her, took her to Turkey, and told uh, Turkey about it. And what happened? Turkey had a pouch in his pocket, and I guess he had some herbs in it. And what he did, he put it on her lip. And when he got through with putting this herb on her lip. By the time he finished spreading it on, her lip had gone down. He traveled all up and down roads to go see people, people who were sick, who had, maybe they had a rash on them or boils or, uh, you know, they could have pneumonia or they could have, uh, he, had a, he had a famous medicine that he called it a no name. And that was a skin medicine. It would uh, take away all of uh, uh, rashes on your arm, pimples, and uh, any kind of irritations on your skin, and he never had a name for it, so people used to say, well, what kind of, what's the name of a chief? He says it has no name and became known as the no-name medicine. He would wear eel skins around the joints of his arms, the joints of his legs and his feet to take care of the problems of arthritis. 
there was a medicine that he called that was called snake oil. He would take the eels that he would catch that far from here in the Potomac River there and he would make his snake oil. Uh, oil that he would make that was good for infections. He used uh, the snake oil and some of the plants that he uh, prescribed for, for swollen joints and things of that nature. And I remember one time my wife uh, was having a problem with uh, a swollen knee and he, and he came by and, and, brought, uh, and brought some stuff and, uh, and, uh, and put on my wife's knee and it wasn't too long before it was healed. After I'd sailed for a half a dozen years, I got drafted into the army for Korea. I had six months of combat there. I ended up in the Philippines driving an LCM with a topographical surveying unit. And I came home and I was getting terrible headaches. One doctor said rhinitis, another one said sinusitis, one said tic de la rue, another one said trigeminal neuralgia. I'm not sure what it was I had, but all I knew I had headaches that would put me down on my knees, blind me. I mentioned this to my father one time, and he says, that's all right, son, I'll take care of it. And what I remember when we walked into that room was my dad sitting in the chair and Turkey, uh, with his hands um, reaching up into the base of, of my dad's skull, like just pressing on it. My dad was like screaming his head off because I mean, it, it really hurt. And he said later that he felt like Turkey had like reached up under his skull and was like almost like massaging like his brain or his spinal cord or something um, that was just so, it was very penetrating. But when he, he finished, um, with that, my father never had another headache. I was around the age of uh, 12, 13 years old, and he came one day, and he came there and got me and said, we're going down to the Huckleberry. He said, we're going to be there for several days, and I was just a young boy, and I was a little scared, a little nervous, and I'm kind of thinking, well, what were we going to eat? Where are we going to sleep? What were we going to do while we were there? But when we got here, things start to make sense. We spent the days out here walking throughout the woods, showing me different types of roots and herbs, things that you could use to heal yourself. And he always said that you never take the whole root because you'll destroy it. That this plant here, it gives us life. It helps heal us, it helps cure us. And if we were to kill the root, then we would kill the medicine then. It would no longer be there for us. And then after several days of that, we talked about our tradition and our culture and who we were yesterday and who we are today as Piscataway Indian people. And on the last day of that time, my mom and my dad and several other members of the family, we all gathered here. And I was given my Indian name at that time, which is Wild Turkey, the symbol of our tribe. Well, I think all of that was part, of, all the things that he did when, when we had gatherings of that nature, uh, ceremonies or something, it was all part of trying to keep, uh, keep things alive. The uh, Tyax were the, uh, leaders and uh, they had, have an unbroken uh, a line of, uh, of descendants from the time that they first uh, came in here and established their main village at uh, my own up at Piscataway uh, Bay. A lot of what, what Turkey knew of the land uh, he got from spending a great deal of time on the land and one of the main places that he spent in his life was uh, our burial grounds, the Piscataway burial grounds, which we call Moyon. Hundreds and, and thousands of our people are buried there, and it's also the site of our ancient village. 
uh, where our people had been free at one point. So that's, that's a very important place to us, not just for the sacredness of it, but also a remembrance of, of knowing that at one point our people were free at this spot, and again, they can be free there someday. Because for us, the dead, when they're buried, um, go on a spirit journey that lasts for a very long time as the bones are in contact with Mother Earth. And also the ancestors that are there intercede for us um, on our behalf to the Creator. So when archaeologists started to excavate that area, um, and it was done under the direction of a woman who had bought property there uh, named Alice Ferguson, that really, um, it really hurt that spot. It really hurt the dead, it hurt the living, and it hurt the land. Turkey actually had seen this happen, happen and, and um, my dad saw it, uh, my uncle saw it, they saw hundreds of people just being pulled, yanked, ripped from the earth, and not just being ripped from the earth, but also they believe being ripped from the world of the spirit uh, from the journey that they had been given the instructions to be on. Many of the remains were taken to the Smithsonian and some of them were taken to the University of Michigan, and some of them are now in the, also in the possession of the Maryland Historical Trust, which um, we're trying to get those remains back from all of those places because it's a very central spot to our religious belief. We believe basically that no one owns the earth. Uh, no one person owns the earth, it's just telling it's just held in a, a trust for, by one generation for uh, the oncoming generation. Our footprints are on this land. Uh, my dad's footprints, my grandfather's footprints. Each generation is in stewardship of the land. And that uh, it means a great thing to preserve the land. Because without land, you're not a, you're not a people. You're just a, a, a part of society. Moyon is about 15 miles south of Washington, D.C. Um, it's in an area called Akokeek, and it's right on the shore of the Potomac. Much development is fairly recent, but some of it was starting to really encroach around there in the late 50s and by early 1960s, and that site had been slated for a county sludge pit. Um, Turkey at that time uh, made a decision along with a number of other local people in the area that the best way to protect the site was to turn it into a national park. He decided to take um, 20, the 20 acres which had been held sacred by the Piscataway people and put them in the trust of the Park Service. The Park Service would not be, um, it wasn't really for ownership necessarily, it was more for custodial purposes for taking care of it. Uh, he believed that this was the best option at the time and, and maybe in fact that was the only thing that he could have done to have saved the site in any way he could. What happened was is that on the date of transfer he made a verbal agreement with Stuart Udall who was the Secretary of Interior and he asked for two things. One was that he could be buried uh, at that site with his ancestors, and two, that his people would always be able to go there. Those were the agreements and that was made. What we found later was that while they took the land, as always, they didn't uphold the promises. In the early 70s, I met a, some Indians from out west. They came to Washington, D.C. to open an office uh, for the American Indian Movement. And I was really shocked, because here was some Indians who, man, uh, wearing their hair long, wearing chokers, Indian-style clothing, telling it just the way it was, that basically that we were a group of people, Indian people were victims of genocide by the United States government.
then after uh, I met these guys, uh, I went over to my dad's house and that I wanted my dad to check them out. He told me to bring them on over there and that uh, he would talk to them. And he said that, uh, Billy said, I never thought I'd ever see it again in my lifetime. He said that uh, these people are preaching Indianism, to be Indian, pride in being Indian. And he said, you know what? He says, I pushed those young boys and did every trick I knew to get them excited to make sure they weren't lying and everything. And he said, they were straight. And he says, I was real, real proud of uh, what they said and everything. And he said that uh, I think they for real. They're for real. There was the Trail of Broken Treaties. That was the occupation of the, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And that uh, Turkey got in touch with me and said, I hear the, I hear the Indians have take, took, took over the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And he says, uh, is that true? I said, yeah, that's true. He says, uh, were those young boys involved in it? I said, yeah, they were involved in it. He said, I want you to come over here and get me. I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, I'm going down there with them. He said, because what they're doing is right. And he says, it's our duty and it's our obligation to go there and be with them, me and you. And he said, I don't know what the hell is going to happen here, Billy. But he said, whatever happens to the people here is going to happen to us because we're with them 100%. And he went every single day to the Bureau of Indian Affairs until the end of the occupation. Then later on, these other walks started coming back in. A lot of these walks were to, uh, to protest the, uh, the treatment of, of Indians. One was the longest walk that came all the way from uh, Alcatraz, launched by Chief Bill Eagle Feather. Now when these walks would come in, Turkey told me, he said, you be sure to tell me about what's going on and that uh, you come over here and get me, Billy. He didn't believe in telephones. He said, Telephone dis telephones disturbed your, your, your sleep. They were too modern. He says, if you want me, you come over here and you leave a note on my door for me and I'll get in contact with you and we make arrangements to meet. He told me, he said that, he, he said he just had to be here for the Indian people. He said it was a critical time for the Indian people and he was there. He always walked with the, up front with the elders one of the things he would do, he would always carry, when he went on official uh, meetings, he would carry his bonnet that he had. And he had it like in a paper bag, a brown paper bag. He loved the brown paper bags. And that uh, before he'd go into the, into the meeting, like with Senator Fulbright or, or some official, he would he'd wait a minute and he would take the bonnet out and put the bonnet on his head. And that represented authority of who he was. He was a chief. He'd go in and say, uh, we're going in here officially. That's why you got to go in here properly. He says, you got to represent yourself properly. And he says, that's why I'm doing this here. During that time period, we suggested that Chief Turkey appear at the National Park. He had an agreement with the Department of Interior when the uh, park was created that he would have the right to be buried there because he wanted to be buried with his ancestors, the old people, the ancient ones. That, and he had a right to be buried there because he was the one that kept the traditions, kept everything alive. And he himself had marked the spot by, by um, planting a red cedar tree, a sacred red cedar tree. So he knew exactly where it was that he wanted to be buried and it was in the graveyard, um, the section of the, of the burial grounds that had belonged to the chiefs. He went to the Department of the Interior to arrange for his burial. He was um, told that he had no such rights when he said that Secretary, uh, Secretary Udall had made the agreement with him. They said, he never heard of you. And so up until his death, uh, he took an active part in the lobbying to get himself buried there. They lied to him, just like they've always done. They lied to him. He was pretty shocked because he was in his late 70s. And he had to go to what, he didn't know what to do. And he said, well, Chief, the only way you're ever going to get buried there since it's a national park, you've got to get an act of Congress to get you buried in there. 
The dying wish that Turkey had was to be buried at that site. He said, bury me there and I will be able to help you always. During the fall of the year, when all of us are starting to put on our warm coats, he was still swimming in the Potomac River. He said, it's good for you. It helps heal you inside and it takes care of your physical problems for the water has great power to it. It has great spiritual power and great medicine power to it. He had gone fishing for herring on the Wicomico River and he was in cold water in November, pulling in the nets. And he was looking at the younger guys who were complaining like they were weaklings. You know, complaining about cold water and it's only November, it wasn't winter yet, there was no ice on the bay or ice in the river, not yet. And he came down with what he said was a grip. He got sick and he caught pneumonia and that, uh, that led to him having to be taken to a hospital for the first time uh, in almost 70 years and in the process of uh, him being treated there for uh, pneumonia. He was a veteran now at the VA hospital. Uh, they discovered that he, was, he had a leukemia. But he had a fever of 105, 106. And he had something though and the pouch that he wore, the beaver skin pouch that he always carried with him, some form of a medicine that he took and put it in his mouth. A few hours later, the doctors came back. What happened to this man's fever? Where did it go? The doctors couldn't figure that out because he had the power to communicate with these plants and these roots and herbs to always heal himself. But with this cancer, he did not understand that because it was not natural to our people. It was not natural for the plants and the roots and herbs. So if because of that, he could not heal himself. And they uh, gave him six months to, uh, to live and they didn't want him to know because while he was in the hospital, he had like um, some medicinal things around his waist and on his head and around his wrist and legs and everything. And the doctors came to him and asked him and said, uh, well, chief, what are those skins around your, uh, your uh, legs and arms and everything for? He says, he says, what do you got them for? And Turkey looked at him, he says, you know what, doctor, I'll never tell you. And the doctor said, why? And he says, because this is Indian medicine. And y'all ridicule Indian medicine. And while he was there, um, the doctors became so fascinated with him, as they arranged for him, even though he was a patient in the hospital, they arranged for him to have a seminar with the, with, with the doctors of the VA hospital. And uh, he went there and he spoke, and they were really amazed at the amount of knowledge that he had. I remember when he was uh, when he was in the uh, in the hospital there, the veterans hospital, uh, and we uh, just prior to his death. And I remember him saying uh, to me at uh, that uh, that that Billy had a lot of uh, responsibility on his shoulders, and that. Uh, and he would appreciate it if I would help him as best I could, and I said, I will. He asked him, I said, he, what, what he wanted to do, and he said he wanted to die a natural man. He was a natural man all his life, and he wanted to die a natural man. December 8, 1978, Chief Turkey died. And a sort of a sigh of relief came above it as in, you know, Department of Interior, Park Service, oh, the old Indian dead, uh, we ain't got to worry about him no, no more, but they didn't know me, didn't know his son, didn't know that 
didn't know the, the impact that the AIM movement had on people in this country and I refused to bury Chief Turkey. The treaty's a treaty. He made a treaty with the United States government to be buried there. And they tried to renege on it and they weren't going to get away with it. And I fought for almost a year to get him buried there. Went everywhere and spoke to people. Five people, 500, 5,000, it didn't matter. All of the United States to get him to put pressure on Congress, you know, and newspaper articles came out, all he wants is a grave. By 1979, through the efforts uh, led by Billy Tyack and the Scataway Nation, and by many, many hundreds of uh, Indian people all across the country and other people of other backgrounds of goodwill and good conscience, uh, an act of Congress finally passed. Congress finally relented and the man who really pushed the bill very hard was Senator Paul Sarbanes of Maryland. And he was buried November 11, 1979, almost 11 months after his death. We have a ceremony that's called Making of Relations. He made a relationship with an individual by the name of Chief Eagle Feather from the Rosebud Sioux people from South Dakota. A relationship and a pact that he made that when he passed on to the spirit world, whichever one was to go first, they would come there and they would bury the individual. And when he passed on to the spirit world, he wished to be buried in his traditional sacred homeland. And he was buried there at that time and he was given a full traditional native burial from the ceremony, the making of relations. And I was a pallbearer for him and, uh, and was, able to, was able to carry his, his, his remains for that final journey for, for a while. We kind of, uh, during that procession, uh, we We tried to let as many people um, be pallbearers as could. We couldn't bring a vehicle in to the gravesite. In defiance of the act of Congress, um, the day, the time when everybody was gathered with the hearse to take the body in the in the coffin. It was originally in a coffin to take it down to the burial site, the Ferguson Foundation would not allow the hearse to go down the road. The Ferguson Foundation, which had been established um, after the death of Alice Ferguson, uh, which is composed of largely, um, basically of the white uh, landowners in the area, the board of directors, um, who act in a sense to keep out all people who they see as polluting their racial purity. Um, had defied um, the act of Congress. They had lobbied against it. They didn't want any people uh, that were not a part of what they considered to be their group to be in that area. And, uh, and it was raining that day. It was really a miserable day. Um, but it was at the same time a joyous day too because we know that he was with his maker. There's an old custom that uh, when a chief dies, a cedar tree is buried right near him or on top of him, and that uh, he becomes part of a living thing. And that tree today has really grown. And I was one of the barrel pile barrels for Turkey to be buried there. And it's a lot of remembrance go along with him to that grave. He always sang a song. Ha ha ne, ha ha ne, ha ha ne, ha ya, oh ha ya. That was his song that he sang. And he did a dance that he was moving in time to the wind moving in time to life, moving in time and harmony 
with creation. And I remember he just loved, he loved to dance. And um, I know until, up until, you know, the year he died, like people would always know, oh, that's Turkey. He just, you know, he just loves to dance. And part of it was just, you know, I guess in celebration of the joy of life. And um, the other part of it was that in itself, like um, he said, like when you're, when you're sweating, um, in any way that you can, it's good for the body. It gets rid of the poisons of the body. Just everything with him, it was always a good time. There was never any, you know, conflict, any hard feelings of anything with him. Never no fights or anything. It was just a good time, peaceful times when he was around. Chief Turkey uh, instilled in me a lot of the values that, um, or continued to instill a lot of the values that um, my parents had passed on to me and uh, to make sure that I uh, maintain a stable life. Um, I think that carried on through my Navy career and through the rest of my life. Um, up to this point, I tried to instill those values in my children. It meant a lot to me. And, uh, and those things that, he, he, like I said, he instilled in me as a child, I've carried with me all my life. So. A few years ago, they started changing the uh, names of the roads in the county. And uh, within the last year, they decided that all roads in which there was uh, more than one dwelling you know, had to have a name. And so uh, in honor of Turkey, I named the uh, road that came into here Turkey Tayak Place. He walked just about everywhere. He, uh, I don't recall uh, unless somebody volunteered to, to offer him transportation. That's, that was pretty much his mode of travel, was walking. People would say, oh, I knew your grandfather. He, you know, he would um, be walking down the street hitching a ride and he'd be wearing that old World War I wool coat and, and we remember him that way. When I first seen him, I was about 10 years old and I was at my uncle's house. And Turkey was coming around at that time, talking with people, trying to get them to um, join up so they can start um, an uh, Indian school. He wasn't afraid of anything, he wasn't afraid of anybody. He always stood his ground when we were at Huckleberry or down at the burial grounds where we, as you know, probably had lots of uh, complications and confrontations with the Park Service. And uh, he always stood his ground. He would never leave. He would stay until he was ready to go, regardless of what they would say. I can remember when uh, they had all the police come down there. It was my father and Avery Lewis and my grandfather were all down there and they wanted them to leave. And they flew the helicopters, all the different, you know, police forces came in there trying to force them to leave and he would not leave. And uh, they didn't make him leave. So he was a strong man. And Turkish seemed to have been a man who really checked out his life and life of his people different tribes across the nation and tried to get recognition for his own tribe, the Piscataway. He worked at it continuously and everywhere possible. He was the spark that kept who we are as Piscataway people alive for each and every one of us today. Many times it's been said that the spirit um, is the flame, the spirit is, is the fire, the souls and, and the souls of our people are, are like fire. And they also say that we have, um, that for Turkey, that he had, was one of the ones that had the fighting spirit. Even though these flames had been, they tried to kill those flames off, that they had tried to dampen them, but we knew that there there were embers and there were the flickering flames. It was called the flickering flames of Indianism and that was Turkey. This is uh, a condolence cane and this was uh, given to us uh, 
one year after Turkey was buried by the Iroquois people. And uh, what it de uh, depicts here is the fact that if you see up here, there's three tracks. There are turkey tracks. And our history tells us that uh, there was uh, 13 chiefs here came or in existence before the coming of the Europeans to our land. And they came to our land uh, in 1634. And they was, uh, came on two ships. One was the Ark, and the other one was a dove. And these are the chiefs after uh, they arrived in our land. Now, this is a very significant chief right here, is it shows a, a old beaver hat. And the beaver hat is uh, turned upside down, and that signifies the dead Lincoln. President Abraham Lincoln, and this is one of our ancestors meeting with the man who assassinated uh, President Lincoln, John Wilkes Booth, and uh, he helped him escape uh, from Maryland into uh, Virginia, and this is Turkey, the square peg right here, Turkey Tyak. Now what you do here, you flip the cane over, and you tell us a bit about his life. Now, it was estimated he was born on uh, August the 29th, 1895. They say he was born on Frog's Day. And this is Turkey Tyak. He was a member of the Beaver Clan. Now, from 1908 to 1915, he was a, a, a work in the mines, and he was a hobo. He went all across the country. This here, you flip, flip it back over, it shows that he was involved in World War I. He was, uh, he was uh, involved in four major battles in World War I. He went back to his uh, grandmother's teaching, and he started using uh, the Indian medicine. And this is like an eel skin here. It means Choctaw Chink. It means principal chief. This is my mother here. He married my mother. And she had uh, uh, three boys and two girls. And this is the day I was born, right here. And then he, he was married again to his second wife. And he had the same thing, three girls and two boys here. And uh, he died December 8th, 1978. And this is, this, he's up on a scaffold. That shows of a dead chief. And where he's buried at, in Akakeek, Maryland, there's a sacred cedar tree there. And he told us that when he passed on to the spirit world, that he would be able to still help us from that sacred tree. We gather there every year, and we have a ceremony there that's called Feast of the Dead, where his family, other native people, and friends come there today. And we make tobacco ties to remember our, our family, our people that have gone into the spirit world. So 20 years later, he's still touching each and every one of our spirits. Because Turkey is there, we have a connection there and it can't be broken. And so even Turkey in death is there protecting and making sacred the site of Moyon. Turkey today is looking across the river at George Washington's home saying, yes, we're still here and you're not going to destroy us. All the policies that you put into forth, becoming the president, first president of the United States and your successors have put in, but you're not going to destroy us. So he's there looking across the river confronting George Washington every minute, every second of every day. And I believe it's a symbol of the Indian resistance in this country today. I'm here to tell uh, the United States government and all these other immigrant governments of North, Central, and South America, and I'm living proof of it, that their policies of genocide failed. And we we're on our way back. And that's the legacy that uh, Chief Turkey left us.
Yeah.